for all being here tonight for what we believe is an incredibly important conversation about smartphone use and digital wellness. As parents and educators, we are navigating a landscape that is rapidly changing, one that profoundly impacts the way our children interact with the world around them. Over the recent years, we have seen changes in our children's behavior. With the presence of smartphones and digital devices bringing new challenges, including increased anxiety in the classroom, at recess, and in social interactions. There is so much we already know about the influence of technology, but there is also a great deal that remains unknown. Our purpose tonight is to come together to share what we do know and to be honest about what we don't yet fully understand. But one thing is certain. We all share a common goal. We care deeply about the well-being of our children, and it is critical that we come together to learn from one another and strengthen our community's collective knowledge. At school, we are fully committed to educating our students not only academically, but in areas of digital citizenship and wellness that will help them navigate this complex digital world responsibly and safely. As Adina mentioned, we are focused on digital wellness. But what does that mean? It's about finding a healthy balance with technology, understanding how to use screens responsibly, being aware of content consumed, and recognizing the impact of digital interactions on mental and emotional well-being. This is something that adults find challenging. Research shows that when children develop strong social and self-awareness, self-management, and responsible decision-making skills, they feel safer, more comfortable, and supported. This allows them to become more available to learn and build healthy relationships with peers and adults. Technology isn't going away anytime soon, so education is more important than ever. These same skills are now as important online as they are in person. Through our social emotional learning, SEO, and technology curriculums, which include digital citizenship, topics such as how technology makes you feel in grade one, or respect and kindness online in grade five, we are teaching our students how to make informed choices about their digital wellness. This means instilling in them the values of respect, empathy, and responsibility, both in how they interact with others in person and online. As a school, we are in implementing additional workshops this year focused on digital wellness into our SEO and technology curriculums. Starting with Katie Albert, educator and board certified behavioral analyst, who will be running workshops with our grade five and six students in November, and Talis Wise will be coming in to talk to our grade two and three students in January. We continue to plan and work with other organizations so that students in all grades will be exposed to this important learning throughout the year. Our goal this evening is to empower you with knowledge to make informed decisions. Together, we can enable our children to become responsible, thoughtful digital citizens who not only navigate the online world safely, but also contribute positively to it. We are fortunate to have two experts in the field who happen to be Leo Bad parents with us tonight to help us guide this discussion. We're excited to have Dr. Michelle Foster and Dr. Rachel Mitchell insights on how we can support our children in developing healthier relationships with their digital lives. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves and the work that you do? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. There's a lot of nights this week we're all going to be out, so we appreciate that you uh, devoted the time to come. Um, so I'm Rachel Mitchell. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I work out of Sunnybrook Hospital here in Toronto. I do 50% of my time is clinical work, um, and that clinical work is I service um, the urgent assessment clinic, so people that come to the emergency room um, with a mental health crisis under the age of 18 uh, and need to be seen, so I see them after that, and then I also um, service the central intake, uh, so like people that are just generally referred. Um, my area of expertise is in mood disorders, um, specifically in the adolescent population. And then the other half of the time, or actually I should say 60% of the time, and 60% of the time, and then 60% of the time, but anyway, uh, the other 60, 80% of the time I do um, research, um, and I, my area of research is uh, in 
suicide and self-harm among adolescents and specifically sex and gender differences and um, the role of social media in all of those things. Um, and my most recent work is on TikTok specifically and suicide and self-harm related content on that. And um, I think that is enough about what I do. <laughs> So, I'm Michelle Foster. I'm a psychologist. Uh, I work with adolescents and adults, and the area of expertise that um, I generally focus on is mood dysregulation and the behavioral manifestations of that. So, it's like um, severe depression and anxiety, and then generally um, eating disorders, self harm, and suicidality most often among teens, but um, amongst adults as well, and then also with families. So how do we support the parents in addressing these issues, preventing them, treating them, and managing their own emotions, um, and different types of skills that they can use to uh, to address all of that. So we've often worked together as many to say, so actually, I didn't know you were a Leo Beck parent until this initiative started, um, but we always work together <laughs> um, on the phone. <laughs> exactly, so it's, it's uh, all coming full circle. We're really happy to be here, and um, we have kids that span the different grades here as well, and so um, this is a personal issue for us too, and we're in it with you, and we have some different perspectives, and our goal is just to give you the info and whatever decisions people make, um, those are yours to make, so um, we're happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Let's start with the research. We're hearing more and more about studies and experts warning of the dangers of smartphones and social media posed to the mental health of children and teens. What does the research show from your perspective? Okay, so this is a big question, obviously, and it's hard to summarize, but I'm going to take a few minutes, and this might be the longest answer of the evening, because um, I really want to set the stage. So there's two very clear phenomena that are happening since basically 2004, 2005. And for those of you who are visual, um, they're just picture a graph. And so for a while, mental health in kids, mood, suicide and self-harm, I'm putting them all of them all the same, um, humbling along. And then basically what you see is a spike. And I'm sure we have hockey people here and it's really like the shape of a hockey stick. And it goes up and it continues to go up and it's undeniable, and you can't, like there's no, there's no myth, there's no alarming headline, there's no conspiracy theory, it's a line, and it goes like this, and it, it, nothing changed in how we measured it. Um, there, right at the same time, um, exact same time frame, continuing now, um, is when, so it's, it coincides almost perfectly with when social media, but specifically when the smartphone came in, out. And so there's a very clear phenomenon this when the smartphone was launched and um, when and then social media and social media use and screen time. And these two things are like two graphs side by side, um, but we have no idea if one causes the other. And all you hear about all the headlines and everything everybody's debating all the time is, does, is one caused by the other or do they just both exist at the same time? And the answer is we don't know. And there's a lot of people trying to figure it out. Um, that's, that's the main thing. And there's a lot of um, things that need to happen in science and research for you to be able to show that one thing is causing another. Um, and the research to date can't show that. Although a lot of people have ruled out a lot of the other possibilities and are very sure that that's what it is. But I will say, I was at a conference recently in Rome, and I got asked a million dollar question, and I'm going to pose it to you today, because social media use, and specifically screen, screen phones, phones, all that stuff, has gone on all over the world. It really has gone on all over the world. But these mental health outcomes that we're seeing aren't happening all over the world. They're happening in certain countries, not all countries. So if social media is happening and there's all these problems with it, and we know that there's all these problems with it, but it's not happening all over the world, then why? And that's the million dollar question. Um, and I don't think we know the answer to that either. Um, that said, for a lot of very good reasons, um, social media and screen time use in general, just by common sense alone, um, is 
It makes sense that it's no doubt contributing to the problem. And we have enough research to tell us that, that it is part of the problem. But if you take away one thing from tonight, take away that if we took away all of our phones and all of our screens from our lives completely and your children's lives, are they going to be perfectly happy from now on? And are, is that great, that hockey stick you know, that I'm talking about, is that really going to get better? Not necessarily. Certainly no, because kids need lots of different things to be happy. They need a family that loves them. They need a school to go to that is going well. They need a community that cares about them. They need friends. And they need a government and policies that prioritize them. So, you know, it's really not black and white. It's very complicated. Can I say one more thing? Please. Okay. I just want to talk about, I want to talk about specifically the Surgeon General um, in the U.S. and that decision in May 2023 to issue a warning. Because I think that really turned things. Um, and then since then, there's been other things. There was like a UNESCO report. UNESCO is just like all the countries come together. And basically, the research that informed this, the, the, the uh, Surgeon General um, is exactly the same as the one that informed the uh, UNESCO report. And everything says there is no perfect study and no perfect research that shows that these two things are related. And they are actually really flawed and really problematic. <laughs> but this is where common sense comes in. It's because you're, they're trying to compare pink lady apples to Macintosh apples. And pink lady apples will never be Macintosh apples. They just won't. So, but you need to study only Macintosh apples. And what do I mean by that? And they're just looking at lots of different things. They're looking at video games. They're looking at social media. They're using it. They're looking at screen time. And they're trying to put it all together. None of these, each of these things is different. Each person that's using them is different. And the research is, is just a big mess. And there's no clear signal. <laughs> right? But the Surgeon General did something quite brave. He, I think, he did, he's decided that he was going to take all the research and everything that he was seeing um, and everything that we know about mental health and make an issue a warning. And the reason for the warning is because there really is a problem. And it doesn't quite matter. And he got a lot of <laughs> complaints about this, especially from the corporations. Um, but not only from the corporations, also from the scientific community, because scientific communities like science. And they like science to be good. And they like policies to be based on science. But I can tell you that all that will happen is if you wait for the science to be good, then we're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and we won't get it. And that's what happened with like decades of smoking and decades of people's lives. So we can't wait that long. So what he did is he took common sense and he made a decision about what he was seeing. Um, and so, and I just, and, and that warning is really just nothing more than that. It's just a warning. It's just, and it's an advisory. Um, but it focused on two things. Um, one, and, and then I'm going to stop. I promise. I promise. I promise. Oh, <laughs> the one part, the one thing that it said was it highlighted social media. So the Surgeon General was not screen time universal. It was social media. It gets confused. These things get confused. They're not all equal. Screen time is not all equal. Social media is its own thing, and social media and how you use social media is different. Um, it, it's, it's not the same. And for, it depends on what demographic you are. But there was two things that he said. There was one, the excessive use of social media, and, and those were the words. And then the second one is the access to content. And those are two things that he said that were really problematic and that he really wanted to see focus on. And so with that, we're going to go into the specifics. And now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> So we are all in this room with different ages of kids, um, and we understand that also that social communication in 2024 is very different from when we were growing up. I grew up maybe differently than some of you, but um, all of it looks different than it does today. So can you explain how chats and social media and the increased number of personal devices have truly changed the landscape? What key things would you like, or do you think are beneficial for parents to be aware of? 
So I think we have to take a look at what we're actually seeing and amongst whom, right? So we've talked about um, the increase in mental health difficulties. We have to focus on what that looks like. So for example, in girls, we're seeing a specific spike in self-harm. We're seeing higher risk of eating disorders. We're seeing um, difficulties with depression and anxiety and social anxiety and all of that amongst both genders, right? But in girls, those things in particular um, are, are more heightened in them. And so when we think about how we want to navigate social media for them, we have to think about what is going to pose the risk and to whom. Um, one of the things I like to consider when thinking about exposure is the differences that exist in boys and girls, both naturally and what's kind of reinforced in our society as well. And so in boys, and I'm going to speak sort of in generalities, recognizing that not everybody's going to fit into these unique little categories, right? But generally with boys, when they fight, when they argue, you see it in the playground, they're more physical, right? Girls are a little more relational. You see that relational aggression. They'll ice people out. Um, they'll compare themselves to one another. They'll, I think both, both genders or all genders do this, but there's sort of, there's a bit more knocking down people in terms of the social hierarchy and focusing on social power in that regard. Social media and specifically group chats, right? Instagram where we're using filters and all of these things, it lends itself to comparison. It lends itself to embarrassing one another. It lends itself to FOMO, right? Fear of missing out when you can find your friends and all your friends are together and they're sharing an experience and you're sitting at home in real time seeing that you've been left out. All of those things are going on with, with our kids. And, you know, there, there's so much more to it, but back in the day, if there was an argument on the playground, yeah, a couple of kids would see it and there would be a throwdown or a showdown, whatever, and, you know, they would pass it. Now, it's in your face, the whole grade is seeing it on the great chat, right? It's being screenshot and sent to their friends at Bialik or wherever else, right? And it's a lot harder to get away from it. No shade to Bialik, we love Bialik too. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's a lot harder to get away from that. And you don't have um, the space like you used to to just go home and, and be free of it. It's, it's everywhere. And so when you say what do parents need to know, what do parents need to be aware of, they need to be aware of protecting some time where that's not happening. We need to be aware of modeling for our kids, how we're using our phones and the boundaries that we're putting into place. We need to be aware of what we're posting, right, and showing and what we're allowing them to do. So if all of your kids go to one thing, right, are they are they all talking about it in front of each other the next year? Are they posting it in the group chat? Are they bragging? All of these things, again, you see the mishmash here of social media, cell phones, different types of of screens, um, but it's all it's all relevant in its own way. Um, probably want to add to that. No, but like Michelle and I were talking about this the other day. Like, you know, we grew up with Teen Vogue and and right. I think you're not that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Seventeen magazine. Yeah. Somebody grew up with Seventeen magazine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, so we grew up with Seventeen magazine. But the, you know, they're not. And, and you know commercials and, and body image in, in, in women in our society is not a new story, right? It's definitely not a new story. And so social media didn't create this all of a sudden. Like this existed then. What's different now? And what's it's is the intensity of it. It's, it's in your back pocket. So let's say you just left school, <laughs> and because they get sent from school to my office all the time, because they get sent to the emergency room. So let's just say you left, just left school because something happened. You end up in your principal's office and you say you want to die because that's how you're coping in the moment. And then you end up in the emergency room. And then you're in the car ride the whole way there and you're on your phone and you're looking at it. And then, and then you know, you don't need to come to hospital, but then you're discharged. And then you're discharged home and you're looking on your phone and you're looking on your phone and you're looking on your phone. And then you're sitting in your room trying to remember what it is that you like about yourself and what are the things that you like. And then you're on your phone or not your phone. And then everything that happened that day is happening in your room in that moment. Yeah. And you can't escape it. It's the intensity of it all. And it just makes sense. You don't need research for that. 
I don't think. No, and, and I think that's a really important point that it is the, the body image dis, dysfunction that we're seeing amongst um, youth, teens, right? We saw it with COVID, with being on Zoom more often and staring at our reflections. I mean, I see it in myself periodically. I'll be on the screen all day and it's automatically adjusting my appearance and then I look in the mirror and I'm like, holy hell, you know? Like, I didn't look like that an hour ago because the screen was filtering me. I've now learned how to turn that off. Um, but this is what's happening to our kids. And so, again, it's, it's being mindful as parents about what's happening on the screen and, and what the settings all look like so we can... Um, um, navigate some of that and have real conversations about it. So you both sort of started to touch on the next part, which is from a teacher's perspective, we often see online social situations spilling over into the classroom. Things like group chats gone sour, um, or media posts that aren't inclusive, um, but it begins affecting students' learning inside the classrooms. In some cases, we've even had to pull students out of class to provide them a space to process the situation. This often involves conversations with their teachers or a social worker or an administrator um, to help them manage their emotions and their experiences. So what kinds of behaviors or concerns are you seeing in your work, which again, you've started to touch on with adolescents and youth when it comes to phones and social media, and what advice would you share with parents to help their kids? when they might be suffering from these kinds of situations. I think, you know, I, I do think that that's, we sort of touched on some of that with regard to the FOMO and the being left out. And I think it's important to consider what fires together, wires together, right? So when our kids are engaging in conversation on social media and they're spending more of their time doing that, what are they spending less time doing, right? Their brains are developing at rapid speed when they're at the ages that our kids are, right? They're young, they're malleable. And so they're doing all of this and they're often missing out on those opportunities to have as much in-person social interaction, right? We also see that um, there, again, it's correlation, not causation, but we're seeing increased social media use and increased loneliness. Right? It's social media. It's intended to help us be social and we're feeling more lonely. This is in adults too, right? And so what does that mean in terms of what we can do in school as parents? It means that we want to help them develop those opportunities to connect one-on-one -on -one or in groups, but in real life, interpersonally. Because we also see um, kids are, if I said to one of my kids, like, oh, I want you to go call so-and-so, they'd look at me and they'd be like, what? No. Like, I sometimes even get anxious, like, having to call people on the phone. I never used to, but now we just text everybody all the time. This is what they're used to, and this is the pathway that we're forging for them, right? So we have to think about making sure that their experiences, their opportunities are varied so that they're exposed to more. Um, and, I mean, that's sort of where I would, I would start it, is, is taking stock in that um, and being aware of those varied experiences. Right, so if it fires together, it wires together. <laughs> and because, and basically there's two parts in development or two main periods of development where the brain's like basically wiring big time. And um, that's basically from zero to five and then adolescence after puberty. So those are the two types that the brain is like, it needs, but it needs the outside stimulation in order to wire. Say it again, I always screw up. Well, fires yeah. together, wires together. Yeah, you're making fires together, so you're making pathways. And if you don't have those experiences to make the pathways, then those pathways aren't made. And then essentially, I think that we, we see that in how kids are interacting in their day-to-day -day life. Like when I started practice years ago, and now, you know, kids are a lot less comfortable making a phone call to the point that I get them to make it, they get a lot of services for kids are still self-referral even in adolescence. And so I would get them to make the phone call in my office. They're much more comfortable with text. There's a reason why, you know, kids' health phone is now is is now text. It's like it's always text. Um, because that's how kids are more comfortable. It's not necessarily bad or say the whole world is on text, but it's just an appreciation of understanding how people are being socialized differently. And 
what's the job of being a kid? The job of being a kid is, is learning how to play. And how do you learn how to play? You learn how to play by being on the playground and playing with other kids and really screwing up and fixing it and then screwing up again and fixing it. And that's how you learn. And that is the job of a kid. And if, they're, if it's all happening on the phone, those two things don't replace each other. The, the only other thing that I'll mention is that there's research also that shows that even having the phone in your bag or in your pocket yes. results in being more distracted and affects our concentration, right? So I know you guys have done some, had some really great conversations around cell phone policy and, and it's very hard. I mean, I, I, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes and I, I have much respect for you guys around how you're trying to do your best to navigate that. And I think for kids, that's because of just the way that it affects our brain. I always say it's like having a slot machine in your pocket, right? If somebody said to me, you can press this button every few minutes and you're going to get this ongoing positive feedback loop of people liking your photos, sending you messages, telling you you look great, fire emoji, whatever. Or you can sit here and talk to Rachel, love Rachel, but I'd be like, yeah, you know, if I was a kid and I was feeling insecure because kids often are, like I would go for that pocket slot machine. So if you have that sitting in your pocket the whole time or in your locker, the second you have a break, the second can I go to the bathroom the second that happens? You know, you're, you're going to see if you get that. And it, it pulls you in. It pulls us in. I shouldn't talk about all of you because I don't know all of you, but it pulls us in. As adults, we have trouble putting it down. Think about a kid that has this underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. They don't have the brakes to put it on um, to actually stop and pause the same way we do, and it's hard for us. So we have to, when you say, and these are all loaded questions, right? And we're trying to give you as much info as we can, but it's like, we have to know the science around why this is so appealing for kids and why it can be so problematic, but it's hard to look away in order to make informed decisions, whatever those may be. And they will probably be different for so many of us in the room, and that's okay too. No, I was just going to say what, one more thing. Just the, the brain develops back to front. So all the time when I'm talking about, so the back part of the brain develops the most, then the front part of the brain develops last. And the front part of the brain is what um, is developing in adolescence. So the front part of the brain is also what controls your behavior. Right? That's the prefrontal cortex. That's your impulse control. That's everything. So we're asking kids to do something that we can't do, and we have frontal lobes. They don't, they have underdeveloped frontal lobes. So they can't do it in the same way. And we have trouble doing it with our fully developed brains. Um, and this is, it is intentionally designed this way. We were talking about this. Yeah. Like they have psychologists designed intentionally to make these apps appealing. <laughs> Very appealing. I'm just going to put a plug in there. So as in school, we have shifted as Michelle alluded to, for especially for not for the kids not to have their phones at all, even before school, and when we see them in the school. And like we said, we tell the kids they need to be in their bags or they need to be in their lockers. But I will tell you as families that they are tempted, and so we're not going to be constantly 24-7 watching them, but they do go to their lockers, and they do lift their phone. We sort of talked about, I'm not sure who they're talking to, because all their friends should be at school right now, but perhaps they're also connecting with you. And it's just, it's important to know, and tonight is all about just informing, it's important to think about, you know, the kids have no control, they don't have that self-control and they, they want to see it, and they're just checking quickly, and we're not consequencing them because we're not watching them go to the bathroom. But it is so hard for them. So it's something to just think about, as you said, not just roll. Here's it. Okay, now let's talk about screen time on Broadway. So as kids get older, as much as they just not screen time, there is a need for screens, and that increases. Um, and while it's often viewed negatively, from a school perspective, we recognize that there are benefits. Screens help them with student research, learn about the world, develop essential skills. So let's talk a little bit about the positive aspect of screen time or social media. Um, think about you know, what, what are the positives, and maybe you can also talk about what's more problematic. What are the key things to be thinking about? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I think what you're getting at, what are the positives of screen time? So there are a lot, and that's, that's like social media is not all bad. I'm going to talk about social media for a minute. Um, but all, all in, in a minute, I mean, all screen time is not equal at all. And we actually know this now. This is like one of the things that the research has shown us finally. We actually have signals about this. Um, and one of them just came out, and it's, it's becoming more and more clear and replication, which means one study is finding and another study is finding. And when you put all the studies together, you get clear signals. Even if you're measuring Macintosh and Pink Lady, like if you're still getting the signals. And so what are, what, what's the screen time that's okay and what's the screen time that's not okay? So the most recent studies are telling us very, very clearly that quality matters much more than quantity. Meaning, if you have no idea what your kid is doing for an hour on your screen, but it's just an hour and that's it, but you don't know what it is, and then you could be on, you know, on, on with, with, let's just go with like worst case scenario, they're not feeling good, and they're, you know, seeing suicide and self harm related content, because it's definitely on there. Um, and it's on there in, 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 in space. And I'm not gonna, if you're interested, you can, you can talk to me about it. But let's just say that that's what they're doing. You haven't had a conversation about them and you don't know what they're doing, and it's only been one hour, you were no further ahead than, than um, the person in the next room who's done four hours of video games with their friends in other houses on the phone talking. That is like now how we research. That four hours, yes, of course, at the expense of physical activity going for a walk, talking to humans, actually, in person. All those things are problematic. But that four hours, especially if you know what it is, and it's fun, and it's engaging, and it's interactive, even if they're by themselves, is this thing is, is actually okay in terms of the two things. If you're gonna pick your battles at home in terms of what you're gonna worry about, if it's really snowing or something like that, and that's how you're spending your day. Um, the other thing is co-use. Um, Cody's meaning watching with them is very, very good. So if you spend hours watching something with your child, that's actually really good. That's like, it's not the same as like the psychoanalysts among us would say that that's like quality time. But again, it's better than them sitting on a couch by themselves for that same amount of time. If you're with them and engaged, if you're with them on your phone and you're not talking about what's happening, that's not the same. With them engaged and they're talking about it and you're having a conversation about it. What's inappropriate, so age-appropriate content is the most important thing in terms of what they're seeing, um, what they're on, so and we can talk about that after. The next part, because that's like a whole thing with parental controls, and that's, that's tricky, and I think that that's different also for every family. Um, there's a lot of individual choice there um, in terms of content. Um, but the other thing is that um, passive scrolling, like passively just scrolling, do scrolling. Let's say you're feeling really down and you're just looking and then the algorithm is basically targeting you. That also is, is not good. Um, and the other two, two things that I think I said I wanted to talk about were if you're using the screen to help the child calm down, so let's say they're having a tantrum and a, in a younger child or older, and that's their device and that's how they calm down. That is now very clear in the research that um, is, is hard. It is, is not, leads to very poor outcomes because they don't learn how to regulate themselves. And then they learn that that device, and yes, it works in the moment, and oh, okay, fine, I'll find another better, and look. But then until the next time, and they can't do it, and that's all they have. So that, and then also, when you're on your phone during the daily routines, um, and when you have that phone around in the family time. So they actually were able to show this on um, like 200,000 kids all over the world, over 100 studies. It's just made the headlines, like it's finally actually kind of clear. And people are, 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 are quite unified in our, in our agreement that this is finally, and it also makes sense. So, so not all screens are equal. That's my main question. Okay. So that's the idea of what's what's better versus worse, right? And and um so to say about that. The oh got it. The other thing I wanted to mention there is about the opportunity to find new communities that you maybe won't be able to reach otherwise online. Um, so for example, folks who are from um, the LGBTQ community, for instance, they 
are better able now to connect with peers from other schools or, um, you know, even abroad. Um, there are therapy groups or things that connect people from all over the province, for example, or from different provinces, right? So there's an opportunity to meet people and connect with them, and social media and the screens can afford that. Um, they, that gives them that opportunity. Um, so that's another really important thing to mention. But what I think parents need to be especially mindful of with regard to screens and where some of the dangers lie are the apps like, um, you see it now, they have it on Instagram, they see it on Snapchat, um, where messages are disappearing. So we've had cases where there's different kinds of assault or um, abuse, and those messages aren't, we can't track them. The law can't, it has difficulty accessing them. Um, so just being mindful for kids that um, certain things you won't be able to see if they're engaging in, in certain apps like that. Um, there's also, it, I'll say it like this, it's really important to be mindful of the apps your kids are downloading and whether or not they have permissions to download independently and to communicate with people that you don't know on these apps. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with um, Jonathan Haidt's book, but one of the things that he talks about in that book, which, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. I think it's, it's helpful to get a lot of information, but one of the things he talks about is how, as parents, we are on our kids so much more than we used to be. You know, we protect them in so many ways. We're scared they're going to fall off this or hurt themselves that way, and yet there they are, chit-chatting with each other on the screens because, you know, the predators can't get them that way. That's where the predators are now, right? And we, um, I, again, I don't want to be alarmist to anybody, but I think as parents, it's really important to know there have been several times this year like where we'll talk to each other and it's like, mm, had to call the police again today because somebody was, you know, trying to lure somebody on Roblox or on um, Fortnite or on Snapchat. This is where it's happening. And it happens in ways where, you know, they, they disguise themselves as a friend and this is in the Jewish community. Like, it's not just out there, whoever. Like, it's in our community that this stuff happens. And as parents, we need to know because they hide as children and they then make threats and they get things to leverage against them. And kids need to know that no matter what, they can come to you if that happens. But the best way to help prevent it is to actually be mindful of what they're downloading and prevent messaging with people that, that you don't approve of or that you don't know. That was an important message. We had a police officer come and speak to our students, grades down you know, four through eight, four three. Three. yeah, four through eight. And that was a message that the police officer also shared with the kids that no longer is it the person at the school say, mommy told me to come and get you, but it is all about them learning them online and in the games that they play. So yeah. we will have police officers in the come games back especially well. yeah. in the games. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only other thing to be mindful of with these apps too and the games and the things that they download, even at a young age, there are certain regulations and you know, Rachel always says you can't just trust the government to to oversee stuff for your kids, right? Not to be a conspiracy theorist, even though like I said the I feel like we all we know. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Let, let me let me say what I'm trying to say because that you're gonna make a fair point there. But I, I think um, the ads, the ads aren't regulated. The games might have specific ages, but I had a young kid at my house playing a game, and now all of a sudden there's an ad where you can pretend to be a sperm and grow up to be a, like a, you know in a sex worker or doing other things. And this is a young kid, and they're looking at this, and they're like, look what I did today. And I'm like, oh my god, look what I can grow up to be. It's completely ungoverned, the ads. So you have to be very mindful of sitting with your kid, watching what they're playing, so that you can make those choices. That's all that is. Yeah. No, no, right, right, the government. So, no, it's just that, like, if you think about it, think about how many recalls there are for safety on car seats. Think about how, what would happen if the playground across the street from Leo Beck was, like, if, if the merry-go-round was, like, flawed 
or like that thing that goes round and round, and like it wasn't safe, but all the kids were still on it. And just think about like what we would do as a community. We'd be like, you know, we're gonna put up a caution tape. We're gonna stop them from going and doing that. But essentially what the social media was designed for adults is that we've let kids just go into the playground and there is literally no safeguards whatsoever there. So that's where, don't talk to strangers, like they're not in the parks, they're online and they're there and they, they're very wise and they figured it all out. Um, and then I think the other thing, I, I really want to be careful not to be alarmist, but it's, all, it's so sneaky is the algorithms which I am totally, like, I don't know what that algorithm thinks of me, but, like, I should tell you what comes at me. <laughs> it's like disorganized mom, like, so many things. This is how you're going to organize your life. It tells me all the things, right? About how I'm going to, like, make my life perfect. And so it's the same thing for the kids. But there's, there's this whole concept of algo-speak. And algo-speak is you circumvent the algorithm. So the algorithm has certain safeguards in place. So if, let's say you type in the word suicide in um, TikTok, you're not, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna pop up something. But if you type in sewer slide, or um, off myself, or, you know, what all the other things, unlive myself, um, you know, if you type in self-harm, you're not gonna find anything, but SH is the acronym that, you know, seven billion times or something, that's what our findings were. So, you know, like it's, it's there and it's totally not regulated. And the thing is, is that I started this work thinking that the only way out of this is if they actually regulate. But I think the problem is, is that if you work with kids long enough and you'll start to see that they'll just find something somewhere else. And they will. And the thing is, we can't depend on the government to do this. It, it's just not happening. And so that's why I think the Surgeon General was very brave, in, even though he didn't have all the science, because he's sending the message that like we, we have to, as a community, do this together. And in each of our houses, we have to know what's happening. Because all of a sudden, the algorithm will know that your kid is seven and a boy, and eventually, that YouTube short is going to start showing them, this is just something that came out last week, pictures of people like violently, you know, hurting themselves or something like that. It just comes out of nowhere after they've watched all these shorts. And that's because that's what the algorithm is designed to do. Just like they tell me to organize my home, <laughs> they tell the, they tell the seven-year-old, again, I have from to look. They don't. So given all the scary things you just told us, um, have I steered a little, a little bit? Does it, does it have to be all or nothing with technology? And, and what kind of, how do you, what do you recommend to parents about how to set kids up for healthy social media interactions or technology interactions? Okay, so there are a few things. One is, um, you guys spoke a little bit about in the early grades starting to build up media literacy and awareness. Now it's tricky because it's constantly changing, right? So we we don't want to just completely abstain, and that's not necessarily reasonable. I'm not talking about screens, I'm not necessarily talking about social media there. Um, we have to teach them the skills to navigate their emotions to know that they have safe people to talk to when, when these things arise. The second piece that I think is most important is go slowly. So focus on things like texting, FaceTime. If you're going to introduce something, there are ways to introduce, you know, we have smartphones, we have dumb phones, we have um, Apple Watches where you don't have certain apps that you can block those, right? What can you introduce? And if you're going to do it, be mindful, it's really hard to close the dam once it's open, right? So very, very slow and steady wins the race and have conversations. And if you're seeing signs of, you know, they're going for that pocket song machine or they're, they're always drawn to something the second they get home or they're declining play dates or activities because they just want to be on their video game or whatever it is, that's a signal to you as a parent. Um, and so we also want to be mindful of the community that we're in. And I think the fact that there's people here tonight, the fact that there's initiatives that are growing in, in many different ways, Surgeon General warnings, all sorts of things, 
it's the tide is starting to turn a little bit, but the laws aren't necessarily going to catch up. So it's up to us to have these conversations collectively to put limits in place for our kids and to research because, I mean, I could sit here and say to you, oh, you should download this app for parental controls or that one or just stay away, but it's going to change. Well, yeah, it'll be, it'll be gone tomorrow or Apple's going to come out with something new that, you know, changes the game. And so we can make commitments and we can download different things, but you have to stay ahead of it and you have to have open, transparent conversations. I mean, somebody said to me a while back, you know, we all talk about about when, when we were in that baby stage, right? We talk about, oh, my kid's not sleeping, or like, oh, my kid has colic, or they're allergic to dairy, or this or that. We talk about all the woes, but we, until recently, haven't been talking about the issues with obsession with screen time, about online bullying, and some of these things that are really coming up as a result of this. And so it's the vulnerability and the transparency also that really facilitates um, change, ultimately, I think. Can I just add your first yeah. question, though? Yeah. I think that a lot of people are wondering, is there everybody sort of, I feel like many people want to stick to this and to take it slow. But as parents, it's hard to have to say your kid may be left out of yes. something. That's a challenge. Do you have any suggestions of how you navigate those kinds of discussions? Yes. I mean, there's going to be differing opinions about this, and I'll start briefly, and then I'm going to pass it to you, Rachel. But I think, I think we can always say, here's what we're going to do. I have a kid JK. It's very easy for me to say, I'm never going to give him a cell phone, right? Sure, put me down for that. But the reality is, when he's, if he's the only one that doesn't have it, it's going to be very, very hard to navigate that. So my advice generally, and I also do have an older one, my advice generally is find a community where people can talk about it and um, are liaising with one another. Um, don't be afraid of your kids' emotions. Be open to setting limits, but also be open to negotiating where it's appropriate to negotiate and have conversations about, okay, I'm comfortable trying this, but we're going to do it in this way so maybe they don't get full access to something. And if I see X, Y, Z, or if I'm noticing things, it can always be taken away. It's important to know things will always change. So providing we are comfortable with navigating our kids' emotions and setting limits and sticking to them, but being open to conversation, that's going to set us up for the, for the most success. It's when um, kids kind of come in, and this is what we see day to day, is they come in, there are real effects of being the only one that's not on social media, when your whole class and your whole grade is. That cannot be denied. And there's no research to tell us that, you know, the kid that doesn't have the cell phone is going to be better off than all the ones that do. We don't know that. And in fact, we've seen it go the other way too. So you have to know what's going on around you in order to make those reasonable decisions. And it's not an easy one. And I think we're in it together. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody would have predicted that the conversation or the intervention that, you know, we have to have sometimes with families is, I think you have to start to let this child text now because actually they are so let out that it's, it's affecting everything about their whole life, right? Um, the, the whole, what kids need in addition, but especially like, tween and then like adolescents, less less younger kids, but as they get older especially, they feel like they sort of belong or like have a sense of belonging and, and um, not to be totally alone. And so like I always think of like Fred Savage and his friends, somebody else watched one of your years. <laughs> so okay, where am I going with this? Fred Savage and his friends, like, you know, back in the day would be uh, were sort of isolated. But let's say Fred Savage was off by himself now and he had no none of his friends around him, he would have his friends, his people would be online. And that's a huge positive for people. So the once really isolated child is no longer that isolated. But like, let's just say the normally adaptive kid who's just an everyday, but the family has decided they don't want any social media whatsoever, and everybody in the class has it, and they come home every day and they say, I left out, I left out, I left out, I left out. That's a very big deal, and it actually makes it hard for them to concentrate on any other area of their life. So it's such a weird intervention. I, well, I mean, you 
don't ever tell people how to parent, but we discuss the pros and cons. It's something that uh, you know I facilitate often because you never tell people what to do. You have to think about that as a consequence because the reality is that social media is not going away, and neither is neither are all the screens. And I actually think the way out of this is by giving the kids the tools to teach us eventually. I think the kids need to learn how to manage in day to day and learn what's safe, what's not how to figure it out, and we have to give them those tools to do it. It's our job. <laughs> they need candy and dessert sometimes. Yes, and we also can't protect them from everything, right? And that doesn't mean you're going to go and say, hey, how about it with a Snapchat grade for you? Like, you know, and you might, you might, and that's, you know, all the power to you if you do, and it's an informed decision, and I think that, um, yeah, it's finding the balance and, and starting slowly. And constant conversation with your kid. Open, constant conversation. Okay, so, you know, there are a number of different initiatives for parents. Um, we, we, as a school, as Danielle mentioned, we are committed to doing things in school, but I know that there are things for parents from reinforcing digital citizenship to group commitments around social media. Mm -hmm. So I will say that, for example, in our grade threes and four families, um, there are some families who have are committed to the Unplugged Canada Pledge, um, and they have a, a nice percentage of participation which we can talk a little bit more about the pledge. Um, but I think my question is sort of, how do you know? What is the right decision? What, what makes it the right decision? I think there are parents who don't know and if there's any better from that. Yeah, so I mean, the, the Unplugged Initiative is similar to what it is, is an initiative basically where, um, I think to the best of my knowledge, I hope I'm going to explain it properly, but you sort of make a decision as a community of people to um, withhold social media um, specifically, but also certain kinds of cell phones and, and uh, technology. Um, up to a certain age to sort of give them a chance to catch up, to develop the frontal load that we're talking about, get some social skills, um, find their two feet, and then, you know, and then sort of go into high school. And I think that age is around um, grade eight. And the idea of it really came from what I was talking about, like the, how, how the need to change social norms because we have gone so far one way, um, sort of almost without a lot of critical thinking. It's just sort of happened. And now we're sort of like, whoa, okay, what's happening? And there's a lot of critical appraisal going on. Um, and, and what I'm calling course correction, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, and and um, I think that there's, uh, if, you, if you ask Jonathan Haidt, he's got it all figured out. He's also got a really good marketing team. And, um, and, and a lot of problematic science that, you know, and we could talk a lot about. But, is it, is it ever all one way? Probably not, right? But we have to start to change norms somehow. And how do you do it if you're having that conversation with your, with your eight-year-old? Everybody in my class has a phone, and I'm the only one who does it. I mean, that's a really hard conversation to have when your child is eight. So it's, it's about like trying to put the brakes on what's happening, and, um, and everybody sort of, and how that happens, and why that's important. And, and making a commitment as a community um, to, to, to not have people be left out so that, 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 like I said, they can sort of develop a frontal lobe, develop some social skills, and then go into high school, it's a different, it's sort of a different ballgame. Um, they've had a chance to learn how to study, you know, without their phones or to communicate with their friends without that. Um, and so it's a group of like-minded people that have come together and really started this initiative. Um, and it's taking off in certain parts of, of, um, of Canada, and there's pros and there's cons, and there's lots of different uh, there's there's lots of different opinions about it. I think. Yeah, I think you know it's it's something that we're seeing a lot in um, earlier grades. So you'll see it, um, and I think it has tremendous promise. I um, you know my my hat off to the people who are advocating it and who are promoting it. We have some of them in the audience. I'm sorry, I'm gonna embarrass you for a second, but like Micah and Maddie and, and Laura and yes, yeah, just raise your hand. Maybe can you raise your hand because I. I can't see everyone, and I don't know. Okay. These are really great people who are doing amazing, and we need people who 
are leading um, us all out of this, I'm going to call it that. Um, not to say that this is the only way, but it's one way, and it's a really important way, and we need energy, and, um, yes. and we need this vision, and we need this courage. <laughs> it is, and it's, it's the momentum, right? It's the conversation, and that is so um, massive in terms of changing the tide. And there's also a reason why we're not seeing it take off as much in the older grades, because in the older grades, you're getting the kids who already have access and the, the being left out. So this is where you start young. And if we have people early on committing to this and having this conversation and creating new norms, it can create substantial change. We also have to recognize that things change very quickly. So with a grade five, for example, I may think to myself, well, I can commit to this, but next week, you know, I've had kids in my, like, I've had kids in the office crying and, and threatening self-harm because they're completely left out. And so it becomes a lot harder at that stage in life to adhere to a commitment that you made when that wasn't in front of you. And yet, it becomes a lot easier to stand your ground and to follow with what you truly believe is best for your kid when there is a community of like-minded people supporting you. And to me, that is one of the biggest benefits of something like the pledge and also um, you know, some of the initiatives that you guys are doing here in terms of having conversations and um, building digital citizenship. Okay. You want to open up to yes. a few questions. So Janice, you can help us out. If anybody wants to be brave enough to ask a question, or you can write it on your pen of paper, and we'll say it's anonymous because we won't look, and we could uh, we could answer a few questions. Oh yes, here we have you, Janice. Here. Hello. Um, I'm curious, and like specifically, let's say with something like the pledge. How do you navigate maybe kids who are ready for these things and then their younger siblings um, below them? Because I know my child who's in grade three was introduced far earlier to these things than my firstborn was. I, I very much relate to that with kids that are five years apart and one that's, you know, playing Fortnite and the other is coming and asking me for skins um, or things, you know, because this is the way these programs are built. And so I think you have to be very mindful that what you expose one kid to, um, you may then inadvertently expose another kid to. And so are there protected spaces in the home where, you know, certain things are happening so that that's not to say you're giving your kids video games in their rooms, but maybe that's kind of in a, in the basement and you're doing arts and crafts with another kid. Or, you know, they're allowed to play when one kid is at baseball or something like that. If you feel that certain types of exposure are going to be harmful to a younger kid, and then you have conversations about what you can discuss with younger kids versus other kids. And, um, but it is, it is not easy, and I think there's generally... Um, a lot of people believe that because their younger kids have been exposed, well, they're just ready earlier. But again, back to front, they're not actually, they can speak, like they can walk the walk, talk the talk, but they're going to be dysregulated and struggle as a result. As a score from comment as a school, we see that a lot where parents sort of, would be, they feel like, oh, well, they're ready for it, but they're not ready to say that. It's not actually the right time. Yeah. That's perfect. How do you recommend that we speak to our kids about the dangers of screens, cell phones, and social media? So I'm one of the individuals who's trying to help bring some community around um, staying away from phones and social media as long as possible. But I'm the first to say that I, you know, I'm not an expert and don't know kind of what to do or the language behind. All I know is that there's power in numbers and community. Um, do you have any advice on specific language that we can use to tell our kids? For example, I told my kids that it's coming tonight, and you know, like what, what language can we use to help them understand? Because I think if they can see why it's not a healthy choice, I think that will help. It's, sure, do you want to say that? Yeah. Even yeah. from the school perspective, we can say that a message that's repeated often in our tech classes and, and our SEL classes is one that the police officer brought um, and has brought a few times is 
The only people you should be friends with online that you speak to are people who have actually met in person and have had a conversation and had a relationship in person with that before you with that person before you start interacting with them online. So that's I think one of the biggest messages for, for children. I, I'm learning so around like the addiction part of social yes. media and yes. anger and everything that obviously those are other dangers, but in terms of like share with your kids that screens and social media have addictive traits. Absolutely. And a yeah. four-year-old to understand that language and just kind of any life around. Yeah, so or not for the eight or nine. It's it's a fabulous question, and there's it's a very measured answer in terms of like different ages are going to have different different answers. But for example, you know, with my youngest, and I'll just speak around certain things that I have said, and again, it may be different for everybody. But for my youngest, when they've had access to educational games on an iPad in small chunks, right? Versus watching something that they can move through quickly like YouTube or, you know, games that maybe are less educational like soccer or whatever. I notice a difference in the level of regulation. And this is, again, there's research, there's information that, that shows how this happens. And so having open conversations and sharing our observations there is really helpful. So there are things that happen on the screen that really help us learn and that are built for the way that your brain is right now. But the screen is so exciting, right? Just think about it. How do you feel when I turn off the TV? You get mad at me, right? You don't want to go out your bath. You want to keep watching, I don't know, Bluey or whatever the hell it is. And of course you do because it's so exciting and it's so stimulating. And imagine if you had Bluey in your pocket all the time. What would you want to do, right? And so having conversations like that and using it in that way, again, that's younger, that's age appropriate, right? JK, SK, whatever. Um, and as they get older, you can have more of those conversations around how did you feel when so-and-so did, when you got kicked out of that group chat? Right? How did you feel when you found out that so-and-so were together at this and you weren't invited? How would you feel if you could see that all the time? And how would you feel if, you know, when you were embarrassed at recess because X happened, how would that feel if that was on a screen in front of the entire grade and not only did it not just like, did they all see it, but it didn't disappear. So they can go back and they can look at it, right? And sometimes when you're able to have conversations about the effect on emotion, we can all relate to how things feel, right? They get you on that emotional level because they have the same emotions. And so coming at it from that way is a good way to bring them in. I think, yes, I'm, I'm aware that we like planted some things here that can be like big bubbles and scary, and that's not necessarily a tool that I would use with kids, except I would use language like you talked about around like safeguarding and whatnot. But that's, talk about the feelings and relate it to everyday events um, and come at it as, I'm not against you, I'm with you, I am on your team, and I want you to learn the skills and the strategies that I know will carry you through interactions in person, online, so that you can be successful and feel good about yourself. And the very last thing I'll say, and then, and then I'll shut up, is that um, it's, it, it's this constant um, external gratification that we see in social media. And I think it's really important and can be quite effective for kids to highlight that when you're a teacher, it's normal to feel really insecure, right? We, we feel that sometimes as adults too. And so we want them to develop strong confidence for themselves, for how they look, for how they feel, for how they can navigate the world. And social media is giving them all of that external validation and less opportunity to pause, solve problems on their own, and figure it out in the real world and feel proud of it. And so when you can explain to a kid, I want you to come, I, I want you to have these interpersonal exchanges and be able to navigate them and feel good instead of having social media and things knock you down through comparison and shame. Um, I want that for you and I'm here to help you with that. It, it helps. It's not everything, but it helps. 
Sorry, that's wrong. Earlier, you guys said that you, you know when you're when you're on the smartphone, it's really important to have uh, supervision with that. I think that that's really extremely unrealistic in this day and age, especially with school ending at two thirty and our jobs going so by, for example. Um, like we have stuff to do most of the time we put our kids on the streets because we have stuff to do. Hundred percent. And so is there like a solution for that? Are there some apps that are better? Are there some like it's like like YouTube is there, Netflix, is it okay? Like, <laughs> like how do we know yes. what is okay for them to watch unsupervised? Yeah. Yeah, no, supervising your kids all the time on your screens is like completely unrealistic. Yeah. I would not at all expect that. And if that's the expectation, I certainly can't meet that expectation. I, you know, I have my kids have lots of unsupervised screen time. Um, I think the message, I'll get the answer to the practicality of the question, but the message is actually very similar to the one that we were just talking about. It's about like the idea that your kid should know what is what it is they're doing, how they're feeling when they're watching it. If something is new and scary and different, they should talk to you about it. And you need to have constant conversations with them about what they're watching. Yes, there are those parental controls that you can put in place. There are. You can go to Common Sense Media, you can go to Media Smarts, and you can download and do all the buttons and all the things that they tell you to do. And I have tried, and I have done them myself, and I have still been like, what? <laughs> What? Wait, what? Like, where did this come from? You, you won't get it all. And the only way to, to do it is to educate them on what is there, what's appropriate, and what's not. And what's appropriate is how it makes them feel. And, and then accepting that what they're exposed to, as long as you're there and digesting it in your house with you in a conversation eventually, that's the best that you can do. You can't sit next to them next to in life all the time, nor can you with the screen. And that's not the expectation at all. Our kids are way more capable than we give them credit for, even at a young age. And um, and so, but yeah, like Netflix is safer. I, I do agree that Netflix, if you're going to pick one thing, go. Yeah, so Netflix is definitely better than YouTube. Right, and think about what they're exposed to when they're watching YouTube. So if I think about my son scrolling, like, right, I can't navigate, he's going to watch 30 videos in 30 minutes on YouTube. There's no chance of us having conversation about it, and I can't control what's being discussed. But on Netflix, if he's watching, I don't know, whatever they watch, he's watching a half-hour show or two shows, it's longer and the content is more controlled that we can have discussions. He'll remember something that bothered him versus, again, when something triggers you, if you're just looking at a screen to move past it, you've forgotten it, but it's still kind of in there. And so another thing you can do, and again, we are working parents too, so I fully get it. For me, I'm fine with my kid playing a video game and talking to some of his friends that's social. I'm maybe not so fine with him scrolling on YouTube or TikTok or whatever, right, because of the volume of exposure, but you can also add um, limits around what they can do. So it could be, you know, I'm fine with you going to play video games for an hour while I'm finishing up some work stuff. And then I want you on the driveway playing hockey, or I want you doing X away from screen. And then if you want, if you want to come back in and do your homework once your homework's done, if you want to watch an episode of Fuller House, have at it. I don't know, I made that up. But like, you know, we're, we're setting these limits and safeguards where it's like, okay, I know you're not scrolling YouTube for two hours because I do have to work. And um, that's probably a safer way but it's definitely not the end all be all, right? There's there's different options. So um, I think that's a really important question and I'm I'm grateful that you asked it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, here's if you spoke so well. And um, I learned so much the last hour. I just actually want to second what you said. Um, I find sometimes it's not always a matter of them craving that Roblox or craving that YouTube, but it's almost like they go to it because it's always always there. So Netflix, 
Many of the kids are interested in these TV shows and want to watch them, but let's see you get through a series. And then they're done their show, and they're kind of in this low period of like, what now? That's when they'll sometimes cycle back to that, all the bad habits of the screen that you're referring to. So maybe you have any suggestions in terms of as an entity or whatnot. Maybe just having like a ongoing repertoire of different shows that are on the radar for different grades and different age groups, because then that could jump off the screen into conversation points, right? Like, as we know that, everyone's talking about it, dinners, what they're watching, this and that, right? So, like, to actually try to make those connections between what's going on the screen to social, real-life connections, um, because I just feel like sometimes many hours are spent doing it because they have their screen time right now and that's what's in front of them. And because it'll pull them in. Exactly. Right? It, it makes me think about how um, a couple of years ago, I think it was when my son was in grade two, we did a lot of reading that year. And I posted, for some reason, I don't know why, on social media, um, a list of all of the books that he had read with me that year. And I got so many messages from people saying, oh my god, I've screenshotted this. And then it started all these conversations. Oh, I love this. My kid loved that. Did you try this? And you can do that with TV with other activities, opportunities. I think that's a brilliant idea. And, you know, thinking about some initiatives and things like that, a way to actually enhance um, opportunities to learn about things that um, are helpful and exciting for our kids that aren't perhaps as addictive. But even thinking about shows, you're getting both in our house or whatever it is, they're talking about problems. I had someone say to me, my kid loves Malcolm in the Middle. They're solving problems. They're not doing that on YouTube. They're talking about, oh, I got the skin and I shot that or whatever, right? Like, so I think they're playing video games and they're watching them. Yeah, so that is a great way to build some of those skills, not interpersonally, um, or sorry, build the skills that are going to be interpersonally rather than just full on No, I don't. Okay, you've given us so much to think about um, and left us with a lot of wonderful things to, to really take away. Um, I think modeling healthy behavior is really one of them. Encouraging open dialogue is so important. Setting clear guidelines and um, talking about how this all makes us feel and integrating SEL into our daily lives. Yes. So, that's right. Thank you. Understand 
what the actual engagement was, what they were being toyed with. And I kept saying, what is rare to a six-year-old? How does a six-year-old understand the concept? It's like when I first took my nephew to the basketball game, he was six years old, and he's jumping up and down as they get to 101 points. Pizza! Pizza! And the guy next to me says, isn't all pizza for him free? <laughs> <laughs> because in fact, what I learned is that in the design of the engaged activity is something way beyond our ability to regulate or to avoid. That truth has exploded a million times in the area of age. And the examples described are only the tiniest portion of how we as adults are manipulated into thinking certain things, you cannot assume that the answer is to turn it off and never engage with it, because you want to touch your kids anything. And what I said to the staff was I watched that unfold to, in my eyes, in a shocking manner on the 30th of July. At 3.45 a.m., a man lit a fire behind the school and blew out the windows. And at 8.30 a.m., a man who purports to be a journalist stood out front and told the story, and in the course of 24 hours, had 10,000 people believing that we had been fireballed. But I learned along the way, he had no interest in actually telling the truth. His entire MO was to tease you and to, and to expose the underbelly of your fear and to convince you to engage and click and give him money. And so if we as adults are just as easily manipulated, our responsibility is not to pretend it doesn't exist because it's going to cover your phone and it's going to be everywhere you are. And so every month I sit on a phone call with 97 heads of school of the independent schools across Canada. And the very first call, the common theme was the incredible change in schools due to banning phones. I thought, we banning phones? I don't understand. We never let kids have their phones in schools. I don't even understand. The different schools across this country, talking independent schools, talking about the fact now that kids have to talk to each other at lunch. Let you let the kids have their phones at lunch? I understand that high schools, it's a different experience, but how the kids were thanking them for giving them the tools back for how to engage with each other. And I think what we've learned here tonight is very simple. I think we know what those tools are. And they're not banning the phone, and they're not throwing away the technology, and they're not creating a society of Luddites who pretend that the world doesn't exist out there. It's teaching our kids how to engage thought, how to put the phone away when you're here engaging with human beings, how to have the appropriate interaction, how to know what you're looking at, and how to pick it apart with critical thinking to understand what's real, what's fake, what are the impacts that go into convincing you to click the next link. That's what we're trying to teach. And I love the idea of doing it as a community and committing together to trying to ensure that we build each other up in our kids as well. I want to thank you. I really appreciate seeing you. The entire program, the many elements that Adina has raised and Danielle has raised through the year, are supported by a very generous gift from Alan and Susan Fenwick, who understand the significance of social emotional learning and wellness in young people, and how we need to invest in supporting it in all of us. So I want to thank them. Thank all of you for being here, and I wish you all shut up tomorrow.